we're living in a country whereby there's not enough for everybody. And by that happening, a lot of people, they find themselves on the wrong side of not having a job. You'll be scared that you'll be caught by the police, but what can we do? You have to sell in order to make money. If you're not having a job, it comes with consequences, and consequences are you're going to be in debt of money that you can't pay, that you don't have, that you don't even get an opportunity to what? Unfortunately, on the 24th, that's when we got uh, rechanged, the company just closed. If there is nothing, you have to make something. Some people end up doing crazy things, some people end up selling drugs, and a lot of ladies end up being prostitutes, a lot of guys being gangsters, just trying to to survive. This place is quite dangerous. Every day such people get robbed. Some get murdered. Yeah. It's so painful. <laughs> I don't understand it. It's not like they're bad. They don't have an opportunity. You're just left to die there. South Africa's townships are a memorial to the era of apartheid. When the bubonic plague broke out in 1902, white people were quick to blame its spreading on the black population. They demanded segregation, and the government complied. Black residents were forced out of their homes and moved to makeshift communities outside the city center. Even though apartheid was abolished in the 1990s, townships remained a dominant residential option for black South Africans. In total, roughly 50% of the country's population lives in these communities. Poverty is one of the biggest problems here, and there seems to be no way out. This is my security at night. Danger. <laughs> there is no jobs at all. It's hard to get jobs nowadays. I work at the um, hospitality industry. I've worked at the retail industry, so I do have an experience, but COVID. The unemployment rate rose to an all-time high of 35% in 2021. According to the World Bank, 60% of those without a job reside in townships. Still, there are a few who created opportunities for themselves. Yeah, I'm Bongan. Yeah, my same name is Bongan. Yeah. I'm the owner of the salon from 2008, yeah, until now. I'm still doing it. I come from Eastern Cape, East London. I come to hustle, bro. You see? Yeah, because there in Eastern Cape, jobs are scarce. We don't have jobs there. I've got a lot of plans. I want to have uh, a bigger salon than this one. You see, because I've got a lot of clients. There are so many of them. Sometimes it's getting full here, even outside. You see? So that is why I want a bigger one. So that I can afford to put my clients inside, even on rainy days. You see? That's my plans. And I also want to create some jobs for other people. I always try to teach them how to do this so that they can know it. You see, and then I create jobs. Taking matters into your own hands seems like a solution at first, but there are setbacks. Nossi found a way to provide for her son by opening a bar, which put her in a worse position, after all. Regarding economics, townships differ from acknowledged cities. The communities are trading in and among themselves without governmental supervision. Commodities and services can be far cheaper due to direct money transactions without taxes. 
However, in some cases, the government chooses to interfere. I'm also selling beers, but I'm not licensed to sell it, but I'm doing it anyway. We have to spend a lot of money in order to get it. I would say plus minus 50,000. To put it in perspective, in 2022, the minimum wage is $1.45 per hour. A regular eight-hour job would result in a monthly wage of $466. To support her and her son, she needs roughly $400 a month. Raising the money would take her four years if she had a steady and legal job. You will be scared that you will be caught by the police, but what can we do? We have to sell in order to make money. Until then, Nossi's facing six months in prison for running her bar without a license. But due to rising poverty and hopelessness, there is a bigger threat hunting those who try to provide for themselves. I'm Emmanuel Chakoya, I'm a producer and a music engineer also. Crime is a little bit like higher. It's not safe, you know? Like, especially like me, I do, I do music, I have some other equipment that I, I really like want to protect them, you know. But with the things that happen around, you get frustrated, you know. I was crossing there by the railway there on that other side. Yo, I was getting robbed, you know. The clothes, the watch, and the, you know, and the phone, you know, and uh, it's something that doesn't sit well with you. Yeah. Especially to me and the other, some of my brothers. Something gets stabbed, you know, for small things. I mean, there are thieves here who actually kill people and stuff, and sometimes we get robberies. They kill another one. Where is it? are going to lower the corner. One that was killed there. You see, by the salon here, in front of this salon here, just here, they killed another boy here. Yeah, my older brother, they stabbed him. He wasn't aware that, that the girl was with some other guys, you see? Then there was an argument. And they fought, and then all the guys, they stabbed him. Tried to run away, but he didn't make it. You can't even sit at home and be relaxed, because you know that they will come and take this plasma and go. They will come and take our phones and go. And you can't, unfortunately, you cannot do anything about it. The government's crime report suggests that from June 2020 to September 2021, the Western Cape province saw 56 crimes against a person and 41 property-related crimes daily, ranking Cape Town as the 19th most dangerous city on earth. A lot of people still take the risk of moving here because of Cape Town's economic possibilities. However, the reality looks different. You know, here there's a limitless of ads, you know. Every kid here, they're talented, bro. They're really, really talented, but financially, it's hard to circulate money, you know. You end up like just doing things for, for free because it's hard to take the little that they have. Because all of us are earning low. Emmanuel moved to Cape Town nine years ago. Like roughly 650,000 others, he's originally from Zimbabwe. The UN suggests that in 2017, Zimbabweans accounted for 16% of foreigners in South Africa. Most of them fled from political driven violence and economic collapse. But what they found here is no different. Zimbabwe, long back, it was milk and honey. But now, because of political issues, we are suffering. Yeah. The jobs that we are doing is not even uh, what we actually achieve from back home. Like me, I studied law. But if I tell you what I'm doing now here, you just, you will love. The situation was bad in Zim, so I just had to come here just to look for a job. I'm not working as, at the moment. I was working, but unfortunately on the 24th, that's when we got uh, rechanged, the company just closed. As for me, I also wanted to come out of this place, but now I'm still here and we are working hard to come out of this place. Zimbabweans face a lot of hatred from South Africans. They are accused of taking up the little work opportunities that are provided. 
The Human Rights Watch organization warns publicly about rising violence against foreigners, stating that South Africa continued to be plagued by widespread incidents of xenophobic harassment and attacks against foreigners by mobs during 2020. The attacks and harassment were also committed by government and law enforcement officials. A threat Zimbabweans are well aware of. There is uh, a lot of criminals in this country. As, even as we are working here, we are not safe. Uh, people are being shot there at the tax you understand? So that's part of the thing that happens uh, Some people claim that their, their jobs are being taken by, um, by foreigners and stuff. So I think like almost everything here makes people threat feel threatened actually. As foreigners, we are treated not the same with South African people. And even if we get robbed or what, like to get help at the police station, sometimes it's not easy. You go there, they'll tell you, no, come back tomorrow, or this one is not here, or what. They just rob people randomly, like every, uh, like, especially late, like four o'clock, five o'clock, even at night, you understand? It's, it's so scary. So scary. In 2021, the government also changed its policies regarding Zimbabwean work permits. First introduced in 2009, the Zimbabwean exemption permit allowed workers to stay for four years. That time has been significantly shortened. It's just a work permit, but it's expired already on the 31st, but they just gave us 12 months to stay in here, you understand? This change applies to everyone, even those who have lived here before the bill was first introduced. Edward and his wife moved to South Africa 12 years ago. Two of their kids were born here. How this environment influences the next generation can be seen in Edmund's oldest son, Tafazwa. Being alone, that's what makes me happy. Why? I get peace, like there's no noise. Usually, townships stay secluded. Outsiders fear coming here since reports of violence and crime scare them away. This divides the population strata even further. But there is one place seemingly breaking down this barrier. In 1983, in an attempt to get a hold of all the different smaller townships and informal settlements, the government created Kailiche. It was the first township with concrete houses that were offered for legal lease. People who had lived in the area for over 10 years were deemed legal residents and were brought into the new city. Illegal residents should however be forced out of the Western Cape completely. The separation was violent, but didn't last long. Only a few years later, previously deported people came back looking for jobs. In 1995, Kailiche grew to a population of over 500,000, making it South Africa's third largest ghetto. Some of the new residents brought their cattle and managed to become milk suppliers to the white part of Cape Town. Ironically, milk would once more become synonymous with prosperity, roughly 20 years later. Tatenda lives in Kailiche. His family is renting one of the brick houses not far from the main road. Accommodations in this part of town can be vastly better than in other areas. Some families choose to stay here because rent is affordable rather than not having another option. We live in a family of six. They are six here. Yeah, you can come for them all. This is our room. Tatenda's sister is also living here. She just graduated from school and is now up for her next challenge. I'm actually planning to go to university. Yeah, so I just hope um, some of these universities that I applied at are going to uh, accept me. People here see their stay as an intermediate solution and are hopeful about the future. I just wish to have a happy life. Me and my family, I wish to have a happy life. And uh, 
I'm quite confident that I'm the one who's actually going to make that happiness come in, the, in, um, in our family because I really want to start study further and then be successful and yeah, give my family whatever they, they ever wished for in their lives, yeah. Kailicha seems different than other townships and there is a reason why. The best thing about the Kailicha on, on my side is only entertainment. From Monday to Sunday, 24-7, if you want to be happy, you can. And it's possible in Kailicha. Kailicha is known for its nightlife in all of Cape Town. And in 2018, something remarkable happened. A luxurious three-story restaurant with its own rooftop bar opened up in the middle of the ghetto. It's called The Milk. To understand the significance of this location, you'll have to understand the common rules for black ownership in South Africa. In 1913, South Africa passed the Natives Land Act. It prohibited all Africans from buying or hiring 93% of the land, leaving the rest for the white minority. The Native Trust and Land Act slightly decreased that share to 87% in 1936. To this day, 72% of farms and agricultural holdings are in white hands. Jimmy Jimalo runs a restaurant in one of Cape Town's suburbs. After being forced out of his last two rental contracts, this is his third attempt at establishing a business. We've been accused of many things, you know, that we deal with illicit uh, um, substances. We do so much stuff, but here there was nothing. We just sold our food, you know, and our beverages. The main problem for Jimmy refers back to land distribution. Renting and hiring is the main option for opening businesses. People of color are therefore still depending on their colonizers' offsprings. They, they can deal with you unprofessional and unlawfully, you know, based on the fact that they feel like they own you because they own the building. This leads to an unbalanced power dynamic that can only be broken in extraordinary cases, since white South Africans hold on to their power through generations. The minority are the one with the biggest stake in the economy. So you have a minority of about maybe 10% running 80% of the economy. And then the, they have the dominance in the decision making, even in the political arena. The milk, on the other hand, is built on common land and was financed privately so it can act independently. This is not only a symbol of reclaiming the land, but also a story of breaking out of misery. Um, this is Simbongile, Dweza, probably from Delft. This is where I grew up from. It wasn't easy for me as a teenager, because I had a lot of peers. I had a lot of peers and I wanted to be that person around my peers. But for now, I'm no longer with them because they went opposite directions. My friends going, went into drugs, gangsterism, carjacking and stuff. For me, I couldn't. I had to take a step back. I never knew that one day I could be here facing through the cameras just like, just like I do now. And I'm really proud. Really proud that Kylie Chai is very much improved. From the past, we have experienced much, much gangsterism. I was so scared to come to Kylie Chai, but now I'm free. Kylie Chai is changing, and the milk could pave a way for a new economic uprising but its financial impact is outshined by its social one. It brought something different, something amusing, something worth trying, you know. So it's going to teach a lot of people around here that, you know what, us as black people as well, we can have something great, you know. It doesn't have to be only in Cairns Bay or anything like that. You can build it here and it can actually succeed, so yeah. Townships were never meant to be a place to strive and prosper. Yet somehow, 
they evolved. As rising prices for goods inside the city separate the two sides even more, the townships started developing their own economy. You can find restaurants here, barbershops, produce music, and even drink champagne on a rooftop. Still, violence and crimes are a haunting reality for those who live there, and realistically, it won't change anytime soon. There is no way to justify these actions, but it should be recognized that most of them happen out of despair. The people here rarely get a chance to be heard, so the last words should be spoken by those who live in these conditions, answering one last question. If you could talk to everybody living on this planet at once, what would you tell them? I would tell them to live their lives um, to the fullest because you actually never know what happens like the next day or like later in the day. So just live your life as if like every day is the last day. People must be real and people must keep pushing. There's a day, it's coming through. They must say lose hope because of today or your, your, your past because the, your past doesn't define you. They must keep have hope, you know, and keep trusting in what they believe in, what they see, their goals and their dreams. They must keep on trying even if it's hard to make it, but keep on trying. Yeah. You need to hustle, hustle harder. That's it. If you hustle, everything flows. Guys, those who think they don't have jobs, they've got talents. I just want each and every one of them to try and use that talent, no matter how is it. Just use it. When you've got a talent to use it, you're going to get what you want. You see, you can even have a, a chance to support your family, guys. Also, your kids if you've got kids. But please, guys, use your talent. Don't give up your hope. You must always have hope. That revenge is something that causes destruction. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Like, if you take revenge, some people feel bad and will also want to take revenge. And it will continue like that. So if you don't take revenge, the world will be at peace. <laughs>